While reaction videos have been around basically since YouTube began, the last couple of years have seen them explode in popularity, and it's not too hard to understand why. With everyone stuck inside due to the pandemic, they had little else to do besides watch endless streams of movies or watch someone else doing so. Now, these sorts of videos are typically low effort and fairly simple works with the quality of the commentary varying widely, but they do provide an interesting way to take the temperature of the audiences out there, seeing what films are consistently recommended and appreciated. But while no one's happier than me that John Carpenter's The Thing is now a beloved classic that no one figures out ahead of time and is consistently praised for its groundbreaking special effects, for example, there are a lot of other equally good films out there that for one reason or another just haven't hit very high on the charts. Thus, I'm here to rectify that, and the first film I'm going to be recommending is 1994's Heavenly Creatures, a film which has been mysteriously overlooked, not underrated. That is a term that has been overused in every corner of the internet, almost always incorrectly. If, if nothing else, a film that is underrated would have to have, you know, low ratings. And this one absolutely does not. It got really good ratings from both critics and audiences and won quite a number of awards. Why it seems to have disappeared from public discussion is a bit of a mystery. After all, it was directed by uh, eventual Oscar winner Peter Jackson, who would shortly become world-renowned for his adaptation of Lord of the Rings. And this is the film that convinced me that Tolkien's masterpiece was in good hands. I never actually worried that the films wouldn't live up to the books. I was worried that they wouldn't live up to this movie. I think people were a little stunned when they knew that I was making the film because in New Zealand I've got a reputation for previous movies which I've made which have all been like horror, splatter, gore films. Sort of comedies, but fairly over the top comedies. It was the movie that launched Kate Winslet's career and was the reason for the formation of Weta Workshop, which would go on to become one of the premier effects houses in the world. It was even parodied on The Simpsons. Juliet, this is terrible! Your art is personal and wrong! Albeit a whole 15 years after it came out, why the hell don't more people remember it? Heavenly Creatures tells the true story of the murder that shot New Zealand, where two best friends, Pauline Parker and Juliet Hume, played herein by Melanie Linsky and Kate Winslet, murdered Pauline's mother in an attempt to avoid being separated. Before anyone starts screaming about spoilers, let me reassure you that this is pretty much the first thing we learn in the film. which begins in the immediate aftermath of the murder and then backtracks to show you what led up to that point. Also, the intended audience of New Zealanders wouldn't have found anything surprising about the ending. Uh, this would be like an American film that begins by introducing Mr. Lee Harvey Oswald. The audience is not going to be sitting around going, hmm, I wonder what he's going to do later in this film. The case was rather reminiscent of the famous U.S. murder case of Leopold and Loeb. Two young men who committed a murder basically just to prove that they were smart enough to get away with it. Uh, given that there are at least four movies detailing this particular crime, including Richard Fleischer's Compulsion and Hitchcock's Rope, one can safely assume, even if they've never heard of the case, that they weren't quite as clever as they thought they were. For the entire duration, we know where things are heading. It's an ending set in stone, and this is one of the film's greatest strengths, because despite knowing this, for the longest time, we find it hard to believe it. The friendship between the two girls is enviable, initially forming over their shared health issues. All the best people have bad chests and bone diseases. It's all frightfully romantic. They spend all their time writing, sculpting, composing, even inventing their own religion around celebrities of the day and featuring their own concept of heaven. I'm going to the fourth world. It's sort of like heaven, only better because there aren't any Christians. Frankly, it's the sort of friendship most of us probably wish we had. As the film progresses, this rich fantasy world begins coming to life, courtesy of Weta Workshop's first outing. In fact, Lord of the Rings fans may notice a few familiar-looking scenes. Jackson's camera work is giddy with excitement in these scenes, and his approach is endlessly inventive, such as a sequence where the girls imagine being chased to the streets by the specter of Orson Welles after taking in a viewing of the third man. The actor doubling for Welles only looks slightly like him, so Jackson helps to pave over this issue by actually 
actually reshooting well scenes in the third man with the double, so the difference effectively vanishes. In an interesting, albeit ultimately meaningless coincidence, the real-life Orson Welles played a fictionalized version of famed attorney Clarence Darrow in the film Compulsion. Pauline's mother is played by Sarah Pierce, who would go on to feature in the Hobbit films, and longtime Jackson mainstay Jed Brophy, who would later appear as the Warg Wrangler in The Two Towers and Nori the Dwarf, shows up as a brief rival for Pauline's affections. It's almost impossible not to get swept up in their world, even as things start to grow darker. It's a three-act story with a tragic end. We saw this film as very much being a story of a friendship between two um, young women who had never had a friend before, who had this, these extraordinary um, flights of imagination. They wrote books, they wanted to go to Hollywood, they, they wanted their like medieval um, fantasy books to be adapted into films. Pauline acts as occasional narrator, with the narration drawn directly from the real Pauline's diary entries. I felt very excited and the night before Christmas-ish last night. I am about to rise. Ultimately, it makes the matter of their overall sanity come more and more into question. We have an extra part of our brain which can appreciate the fourth world. On two days every year, we may use the key and look into that beautiful world which we have been lucky enough to be allowed to know of. Was this a transcription of a fantasy or something that they actually believed happened? We're never really sure. The girl's parents worry about their closeness and the looming possibility of homosexuality. Oh. I don't think necessarily that, that, that the murder would have happened if it was if the events took place today, because I think there's a lot more tolerance. But she's always been a normal, happy child. Oh, I can strike at any time, and adolescents are particularly vulnerable. At the you know at the time, this friendship was seen as being unhealthy, and there was a concerted attempt to split the two girls up. It's hard not to sympathize with the girls in the first two acts as they pursue their creative endeavors and revel in their friendship, struggling to maintain it in the face of the older generation who typically just doesn't get it. I think I'm going crazy. <laughs> no, you're not. It's everyone else who's bonkers. Parents, why won't they shut up, right? The film manages to maintain a sense of sympathy for the girls right up until the moment that it can't anymore. You just want to reach through the screen and give them a good hard shake and go, what are you doing? And then there's the film's most stunning achievement, making the murder actually seem as god-awful as murder really is. After seeing innumerable murders on TV and films, it's sometimes hard to believe that we could ever be shocked by one in a film again, and yet Jackson pulls it off spectacularly. We see very little of what's really happening, and yet it's still hard to watch. But perhaps the biggest tragedy associated with this film is just how hard it is to find. Uh, if you're content with DVD, you're probably going to be okay, but God forbid you want to watch this on Blu-ray. It was overpriced on its initial release, and things only got worse, with greedy jerks trying to resell it for absurdly jacked up prices under the ludicrous description of collectible. What precisely makes this disc collectible? Uh, does it come with a signed autograph by Peter Jackson? Does it have a die-cut hologram cover? Does every copy come with a bloodstained swatch of murder clothing? No, it doesn't even have any bonus features, which for a film this rich in detail that was filmed as much as possible in the exact locations where the actual events took place is just sad. Uh, if anyone out there from Criterion or Arrow or Shot Factory perhaps is watching this, somebody needs to get on this because this film deserves to be preserved. The absence of existing commentary or a documentary is probably due to the fact that the release of the film caused the two girls, then well into their adulthood, to be outed after years of anonymity, and he didn't want to exacerbate the situation, which I guess just goes to show that Peter Jackson is probably a more forgiving person than me. They figured that if there's no explanation, therefore the girls must be evil. Only the best people fight against all obstacles in pursuit of happiness. We've never really wanted to focus on, on where they are now because we always hoped that their privacy would be you know, maintained. I don't know, you kill your mother in cold blood, you're gonna have to deal with the fact that it's gonna follow you around a little bit after that. But while there's no justifying the murder, it can scarcely be argued that everybody in this situation really didn't handle things as best as possible. I mean, separating best friends is a pretty shit thing to do, especially over concerns centered around, let's face it, religion. I've got something here that you might just like to have a look at. 
They grew up in a city named after a church, for crying out loud. How much understanding could they possibly have received? Even cats have been seen to lapse into depression after being separated from a beloved companion, only to perk back up when reunited. The simple fact is that being separated from a close friend, especially at that age, really sucks. It all just ultimately feels like such a waste of potential. Though one of the pair, Kate Winslet's character Juliet Hume, turned out to be popular novelist Anne Perry, who, after taking the surname of her eventual stepfather, Bill Perry. made quite a decent living penning murder mysteries until her death in 2023. Make what you will of that. In all fairness, she denied that she and Pauline were ever lesbians. In equal fairness, Pauline's diary begs to differ. We have now learned the peace of the thing called bliss. The joy of the thing called sin. We'll never know. And it doesn't really matter. In the end, the two loved each other in some way or another and had very little regard for anyone else. They truly believed that love could conquer all, a notion which has rarely seemed quite so horrifying. I mean, I'm sure people all the time fantasize about killing somebody. It is indeed a miracle, one must feel, that two such heavenly creatures are real. What is extraordinary in this case is they went that giant step from fantasy to making it actually a, a reality. No.